Uh, can you hear me now? I have the mic on. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. I am going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, improving helicopter safety. Um, I bring a perspective. Uh, I'm, I've been with the board for a little less than a year. I joined in April last year um, and have, uh, in my time there, uh, taken a, a bit of a perspective had a look at uh, the area, particularly of my interests and my background, some of the helicopter safety issues. And this opportunity uh, presented itself, and I'm uh, very thankful that uh, CHC has given the opportunity for me to participate. Had a good session yesterday, and uh, hopefully today we'll have the same uh, results. So uh, uh, I'll walk through, and then there should be plenty of time at the end for uh, discussion. So if you have questions or uh, comments, et cetera, I will be happy to uh, entertain those and do my best to answer. So I'm going to talk about uh, helicopters in uh, the workplace today, can Canadian uh, workplace, uh, as, we, as I kind of see it from my perspective, and some of the differences that uh, uh, need to be taken into account as you look at, uh, at uh, the environment in which they operate. Uh, it's a little bit different, it's kind of unique, and, and People who op operate helicopters, I think, are well aware of it, but I'll review some of that. Uh, when I talk about demographics, I'm talking about the uh, population or the group in which uh, um, it's more ex an experienced demographic of where the accidents are occurring, and it's uh, the associated decision-making issues around that. I'll talk about some ways uh, that I'm going to propose uh, that we target or would be useful to target if you want to advance uh, uh, advancing safety and reducing accident rates. And then I'll look at some specific TSB accidents to uh, illustrate uh, some of the issues that I'm talking about. So it's a, it's a particularly uh, challenging uh, environment. This is, this is not everything you do, but it's one of the ones that's not uh, atypical. Uh, the uh, uh, crash wreckage is there and impact area is up in the mountain and you can see the results uh, but uh, what we're dealing with is uh, uh, a uh, series of issues in uh, in uh, helicopter operations that uh, must be taken into account uh, many uh, are single are tail rotor uh, with authority limits power margins density altitudes hovering out of ground effect these kinds of issues icing and cold weather ops are not are uh, very typical in Canada and a lot of helicopters, the majority of them are single engine uh, with the resultant uh, risks associated with that uh, failure, et cetera. Uh, it's a growing industry. In uh, Canada, uh, 2013, 200, 902 registered helicopters. Uh, American uh, civil helicopter production increased 21% in uh, 2012. In fact, uh, it's been reported in some of the press that the value, the dollar value of aircraft helicopter production in the U.S. is actually surpassing that of business aviation, of business jet aviation production. So it's a growth area. Uh, this is kind of what I want to talk about. It's a quick and dirty, kind of a not very elegant way. Uh, New pilots start off with uh, not much experience and gain experience. Uh, that's when they seem to have most of their luck because they es if they, uh, they escape it and they're, they use up their luck as they gain experience. Uh, it's not sort of a, a trite way of saying you want to try to get them down into here before they use up all of the luck that they come into the aviation business with. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, when Yesterday in the uh, plenary session, uh, the folks talked a little bit about what happens down at this curve. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that. That's where people get a bit confident. They've seen everything, they do it, and they may, uh, uh, there's other causes for perhaps uh, incidents and accidents down that happen down there. But I want to talk about uh, this area in here. So, uh, what, where, where are newly minted pilots that work in commercial aviation in the helicopter world? Majority of jobs are at uh, remote bases, many of them, uh, lots of austere conditions, the self-dispatch regimes for in, in large measure, leaving decisions in the hands of 
uh, uh, and minds of pilots who may not have all that much experience and all that much experience uh, to fall back on and some of those decision-making uh, issues uh, need to be thought through. Uh, a lot of it is high tempo operations, uh, non-routine or dynamic roles and tasks ever-changing. Uh, not that this is unfamiliar to lots of operation, but this is, I think, quite typical of many and most uh, operations in, heli in the helicopter world. A uh, lot of uh, the uh, population is BFR qualified only and very limited or no experience to IFR I or IMC and, uh, and that is a particular problem I think in the, uh, we'll see as I go through the statistics. I'm going to look at um, some of the uh, accident uh, information out of a number of international reports, the Canadian, US and European reports and what you see here is that uh, the majority of uh, accident rates uh, or accidents occur in um, about 70% of them are single engine turbines, 70% uh, of the hours flown, and about 64% of the accidents over the period. Um, the yellow line is a single engine piston, it's the most uh, uh, ra uh, highest rate, possibly uh, related to that's the training environment, but not necessarily because there's a fairly large and growing population of uh, piston uh, uh, helicopters uh, out there in uh, some of the commercial world. But uh, that is uh, where the accidents are occurring. Uh, the European uh, studies uh, indicate, uh, it's quite interesting, a majority of the accidents uh, between zero and a thousand hours over the period. Uh, data from, of course, 155, and many of them, as you can see, below 500 hours on type. A uh, little closer look, um, and what you'll see is um, less than 100 hours experience is the highest sort of rate on type in here. Um, if you can't see it, the uh, yellow bar is uh, general aviation, the green bar is aerial work, and the uh, uh, blue bar is commercial air transport helicopters. So the U this is a statistic here from uh, them as well, and you can see so. The, you're getting the clusters in the uh, less than 1,000 hours and relatively low time on type. Uh, the U.S. statistics are the sim very similar. What you get with the U.S., uh, if you look at them, uh, common cause factors, uh, deficient pre-flight preparation, inspections, uh, wire detection, uh, operating in a necessarily at low altitude environment, inadvertently entering IMC. Uh, these are uh, the uh, majority of the cause factors in the uh, accident rates that cluster in the bottom half of that. From the TSB statistics in uh, 702, 703 and 704 operations, uh, aerial work, air taxi and uh, um, commuter uh, traffic, 91% uh, of uh, all accidents, this is not just helicopter, and 93% of commercial accidents are in uh, those environments. Okay. For helicopters, the accident rate is not uh, large, and I will. See the average is 38 a year. So, uh, in 2011, 2012 the accident rates in Canada were uh, those. And so it's not a significant number, but how then do you reduce that number is the question. Um, we uh, are very, uh, for the TSB, we publish a watch list for those that are aware. 2010, it came out first in 2012. For the air mode, uh, CFIT, 
and uh, safety management systems were two of the areas that are particularly applicable to the helicopter operations and I'd like to spend a little time talking about that because those are areas where we see um, uh, problems or issues uh, and uh, in particularly in sea fit collisions with land and waters the accident rate in Canada has not diminished over the last 10 years and so we're concerned about that. Talk a little bit about uh, control flight into terrain. Um, key factors in this are uh, darkness, of course, fog and snow, visibility issues, fatigue and ex inexperience have played a role in the accidents and distraction in the cockpit either from uh, use, or use or non use or attempting to use checklists and conversations. But about once a month these factors combine to result in, a, uh, in an accident. Between 2000 and 2009 there were a total of 129 uh, controlled flights in a train and that's not just helicopter world but that's all so it's a, it's a concern that we have. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about safety management. Um, I want to make the point that safety management systems and safety management are not necessarily the same thing. A safety management system is, as you are aware, is a formal program uh, required by the regulator for some operators, but uh, safety management is a practice uh, that's a sub, a sub, a sub, that is in integral to that. Um, and uh, what I would like to talk about a little bit is not so much the issue of what happens with SMS in, in air operations in Canada, that will progress. Uh, the regulator will do what the regulator is going to do uh, in the future, but what I want to talk about is safety management as a practice among operators. And from my perspective and from the board's perspective, uh, the area of, uh, of better safety management, I think, or practices is one that uh, we want to talk about rather than where SMS particularly is going. Um, the, uh, the mandate of the TSB, of course, is to improve safety and make recommendations, but uh, we're not the only player in this field, and, and I'm, I'm glad to be at the, the conference because it's indicative of the, the attention that's being paid by the industry. Inter International Helicopter Safety Team, the uh, Helicopter Association of Canada, CHC, all players in this and other companies and they're, they're combined to uh, improve the goal. Uh, the International Helicopter Safety Team of course wants to reduce uh, accidents by 80 percent over the next little while. Um, the, the accident rate worldwide is 6.5 per 100,000 hours. In North America it's about 5.2 and and the goal of course is to reduce accident rate by 80 uh, percent and that's thinking big but uh, it's going to take some effort to do that. Uh, it's involved in how do we do that? What are some of the best practices and means by which it might be able to do that? Uh, the IHST has published a top 10 list that it's, uh, it's um, talking about as means to improve the record of safety. Uh, these are them. Uh, I think that it's a, it's a very no, notable uh, contribution to the effort and the discussion. I'd like to talk about a couple of those as ways that, uh, that may be uh, worth a little more attention as we go forward and try to attack the problem in the area of the pilot population that I'm speaking about. Um, now moving ahead. Um, the Flight Safety Foundation uh, makes the point that uh, it's not really, um, we shouldn't be waiting for the regulator to uh, tell us what to do in the industry. If you want to be safe, you really need to take on that uh, challenge yourself. The regulator will move, but uh, if you want to get out ahead of this, you should be moving it. So what's legally required and what's safe, the gap is already large and it's going to probably get bigger. And so it's uh, up to folks in the industry, I think, to uh, put some attention to this and think of ways in which they can uh, move without waiting for the regulator. I'm going to talk about uh, cockpit recording devices. 
Uh, critical issue, decision awareness and training, uh, pilot decision making in one of the, um, in this area. Uh, performance and limitation training or making sure that the, the crowd that hasn't got much experience has a reasonable understanding of this and understands the areas in which they're going to get themselves into trouble or they can get themselves into trouble. And, and, and then I'd like to talk a little bit about the issue and I'll be happy to get some feedback from the crowd or the group if you wish on the issue of mission specific risk management programs in operations and I think this this falls into an area in which uh, operations managers, uh, chief pilots, training officers can have a look at operations and decide if it's a pro if they have the right set of skills in their uh, pilot cadre or in their operating cadre to manage it and where they can what they can do to reduce risk. So, um, recording devices. Um, we're not talking about. Uh, um, the whole, uh, I don't really want to talk about the in-depth CDR, flight data recorder. What I want to talk about is, is how best to get information to allow operators and, and management in operators' uh, companies to understand what's going on in their operations. They're the ones that know what they're trying to accomplish. They're the ones that um, are tasking uh, pilots and crews to go and do missions and and they need to have some means to uh, to understand what is going on so that they can identify risks that are evident in the missions and then to decide if they're mitigating them appropriately. Um, cockpit voice cockpit voice and uh, flight deck recorders are not mandated in many many of the uh, 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 aircraft but it's something that should be considered because there are means by which uh, parametric data can be gained from uh, 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 we, we get it in our investigations from uh, GPS's uh, we get it from uh, downloads or, or review of uh, sky tracker data etc it may be possible for people to think about how best to gain information about the general operations day to day to ensure that exactly what you think is going on in your operations is going on and, and to identify areas where perhaps uh, aircraft are being put into uh, areas of risk that is unnecessary or could be mitigated. Critical issue training and awareness and performance limitation training is something that I think we need. To, it's quite obvious that you get uh, young aviators or inexperienced aviators that have uh, the minimum requirement uh, to uh, be, uh, be current, but it was talked about in the uh, briefing yesterday in the plenary that uh, you don't have to settle for the minimum standard. If you, uh, you want to look at um, raising that bar, that's something that can be done uh, by you if you wish or operators who understand the mission and understand the, trying to match the capabilities of the, uh, of the crews to the requirements of the mission. And Establishing a mission specific risk management program is really understanding what operations, what you are doing in your operations, looking at them from a risk perspective and making a judgment as to whether you are doing matching capabilities, equipment and training to mitigate the risk uh, as much as possible in that, uh, in that activity. Uh, cockpit devices as I said I'm not really necessarily talking completely about a flight data recorder but there are many other ways in which uh, um, people can think about it and this is uh, happening in Europe it's happening in the in the states in some areas and some companies in Canada are taking it upon themselves to initiate uh, this kind of uh, parametric data basically flight uh, flight monitoring flight data monitoring on their own to improve their uh, safety record to try to understand to look for areas where they can improve or train more or to uh, ensure that they understand that they're not uh, overtasking uh, their crews beyond their capability. So we talked a little bit about this but these are the kind of things that I'm talking about. System issues which is uh, understanding the capabilities of the helicopters, 
the weather concerns, the effects of altitude and pr on performance, wind and surface conditions, and, uh, uh, and again, uh, density altitude, weight, flight, ma flight manual limitations, and understanding those and seeing how it applies to operations and being aware at, at, as they go forward and, and embark on missions that they should continue to be thinking about these issues uh, to improve their, uh, their capabilities. I'm going to talk a little bit about an example. This is uh, one of the cases that we had in the uh, TSB. The report is out. And I'll just use it as an illustration of, uh, of what I'm talking about. So a young pilot is uh, going to uh, do a repositioning flight of a Bell 206 VFR from Drayton Valley, Alberta, from uh, Whitecourt, Alberta to Drayton Valley. The uh, weather is um, about 700 foot overcast in uh, freezing uh, cloud up to, well, basically it's 700 to up in layers. It is a briefed VFR transit uh, below cloud along a river to a highway, highway, follow the highway to destination. Unfortunately, uh, approximately 15 minutes after takeoff, uh, the pilot communicated via cell phone with uh, um, the ground and indicated that he was at 7,000 feet between layers and uh, was were basically running out of ideas. Proceeded and attempted to do a letdown through cloud uh, near uh, Drayton Valley and impacted the ground and, and was killed. So the issue, of course, is no indication that there's anything wrong with the aircraft. The pilot did not possess a, an instrument rating, was day VFR endorsed only, about 390 hours, 70 on type, relatively inexperienced. So what we're talking about, he, he didn't uh, possess the minimum time required by the company to fly in uh, in weather conditions uh, in the marginal VFR or low cloud. And um, so the, the question, unknown question is why he proceeded to climb and get into layers. But I guess the issue is it goes to a decision making issue and, and awareness. There was discussion between the pilot and his chief pilot about the mission. There was discussion about was the mission necessary given the weather. There was discussion about why don't you take the truck. There was discussion about if you get into trouble, land and we'll come and get you in the truck. But unfortunately, all that was very basically for naught because 50 minutes later he was in cloud in a situation where the only way down was to descend through cloud, something that he was not uh, prepared to do or capable of doing. So. Uh, comes to an issue of young pilot in a situation, perhaps he's not the best person to make a decision about whether that's a thing for him to do. Uh, it was a repositioning trip. Was it necessarily necessary? I suppose. I'm not trying to make judgments. But the issue is uh, pilot decision making in that <coughs> circumstances got himself into trouble. Once you're in the hole, it's kind of late. You can't get out. Um, Elk Lake, Bell 206 departs North Bay VFR to Capus Casing. Uh, it was a repositioning flight for uh, the next day's activity. Um, there was another company pilot as a passenger in the aircraft, so there were two pilots in the aircraft. Um, during the flight, poor weather conditions were encountered and the aircraft collided with a, about an 80 foot tower on high ground. It was uh, shrouded in um, cloud and mist. It, it hit it about two-thirds of the way up, crashed, and uh, the, the occupants were killed. Um, weather was obtained at uh, North Bay, the base of departure, the destination, and one en route location. All indicated reasonable weather. However, uh, 
DFA was not, um, was not uh, looked at, nor were other sites along the route of flight, which would have indicated poor weather and um, uh, diminished visibility along the route. Route of flight was, uh, there was a deviation during the route of flight to avoid weather, and the uh, pilot was proceeding uh, on a path that took him into rising terrain on the top of the hill, he struck the uh, tower. Um, a flight uh, very soon after uh, in the area indicated that the uh, vis was quite low, probably uh, and the tower was shrouded in mist. So it's likely that the pilot just did not see the tower. The pilot had 124 hours total flight time with 51 hours on type. Not instrument rated, first non-training flight as an employee with the company. So the question, I guess, is um, a judgment was made um, that uh, this pilot was uh, safe to fly given the weather and dispatched to, to take the helicopter. I, the only question I would have is some concern about the issues around was the pilot's experience level and understanding of the uh, environment that he might be encountering in appropriate for, the, for what he was doing. He did not adequately review the weather. They did not get a weather briefing um, uh, in accordance with the man ops at the company. And he wasn't aware, obviously, of the deteriorating, condi of the deteriorating conditions. Likely, once they were encountered, um, proceed, continued to proceed and, and got himself in a situation. Okay. Another uh, accident. This is uh, talking about a collision with water. A uh, helicopter was engaged in 212, engaged in water bucket operations in support of firefighting suppression near Slave Lake. Um, this was an ongoing activity, uh, routine. Uh, pilot experience level was reasonably high um, for fly a reasonably good flight time. However, there was discussion about uh, the way the the uh, approach procedures for water pickup. Very little wind that day. The lake was very calm and glassy. Standard procedure with the company and other helicopters was to do the pickup in proximity to the, to the shoreline, say 300, 300 feet away from the shoreline to ensure that there was good depth perception and visibility for height, judging height. In the uh, currents, uh, um, the currents that resulted in the crash, the pilot was doing his approach to pick up approximately 1,000 feet from shore. So, and the bucket went into the water with forward movement and the aircraft as a result lost control and impacted the water. Um, it's likely that there was a, an overestimation of the altitude given the visual references. And so the issue, of course, is um, procedures and uh, compliance with procedures and discussion. The practice was to do it close to shore so that there was good uh, visibility and depth perception. And in this case, it was not done and the result was a errors in uh, height, which resulted in the accident. Uh, there was some uh, inconsistencies found in the uh, record, the, the flying records of the pilot with related to his experience level with bucket operations, but it's not, could not be concluded that that was sufficient to give us a result of the accident. But there was some inconsistencies in the flight hours with flight external load experience. So there may have been an issue there pilot experience level and the way the techniques that he used. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, safety management, not so much the formal SMS but safety management before I go into the last uh, example. It won't catch every mistake in advance. It's a process. But the key concept I want to talk about is, is understanding your ops operations and doing a, a risk assessment and determining one, if mitigation needs to be done, and then to how, how to do it. And what we're talking about simply is, in my view, matching competency and experience to the task at hand 
and to the operating environment. And this can occur at any stage in, in operations in any, any uh, experience level. And it, once you've identified areas of elevated risk, you need to decide uh, what to do about it, and there's many options. You can change the mission, do something else, do some more training, do other things. But that's a task that uh, is left to, I think, best done by people who understand the operations and the, and the environment and, and, and the consequences, perhaps, and do a judgment on the consequences of what might happen. So this is an accident that occurred in Lillooet. Um, the 212 was engaged in firefighting operations south of Lillooet, BC. Uh, the uh, exercise was, was an approach down a steep uh, valley to do water pickup in the Fraser River. You can see the river current going from right to left. Uh, the pickup was being conducted slightly downwind. Uh, there was a series of, uh, of um, helicopters doing this operation. And so on this approach, the pilot was required to uh, wait for a brief moment for the, for the preceding helicopter to depart. He was in a hover, a bit downwind at, altitude, at some altitude, and got into what was apparently vortex ring state. And the aircraft started to descend. It descended, the bucket got in the water, the pilot attempted to fly out of the vortex ring, the bucket was not released, and it rotated around the bucket and crashed in the water. The pilot escaped the aircraft, had a PFD on, was a strong swimmer, however, was drowned in the ensuing, uh, uh, in the water. So uh, in, in terms of experience level was not an issue. He, the pilot had approximately 10,000 flying hours total with about 1,200 on type. 3,300 hours carrying out forest fire bucketing work. He wore a helmet, he was a good swimmer. Uh, the investigation determined that most likely vortex ring state during the recovery, the bucket dropped in the water and acted as an anchor. The helicopter pitched down and collided with the water. The helicopter was likely being operated with the belly hook electrically disengaged. The, the release was electrically disengaged. There had been some reports in the company that that was a practice because of, of um, inadvertent releases during exercise. So it was not available to the pilot in this the uh, manual release was a floor, you press it with your foot, but that required you to take your feet off of um, the pedals, so likely not done in this time. But it wasn't done, so that's an issue. So uh, he did escape the wreckage, but was, uh, was wearing a, oh sorry, he was not wearing a personal flight device and he was drowned, but he was a strong swimmer. So two issues. I guess. Um, one was the practice. Experienced pilot, the, but the practice was to disengage the electric release on the cyclic. So was, if that was a company practice, perhaps an SMS or an analysis of the risks associated with the exercise might have come up to a different conclusion about that. Uh, the issue of wearing a personal flotation device was that something that should have been analyzed uh, in this kind of operation? If you're doing water pickups, uh, you may uh, be involved in water. Was that an issue? Uh, and so I guess my, my question is, it's not so much in this case a discussion about the pilot's experience, but it's he got himself into a circumstance, uh, downwind approach, uh, vortex ring state, which is an issue with helicopters, and into a circumstance where events overtook him and he couldn't get out. So I guess looking at the risks of that operation, the company has made some changes, uh, probably done a risk assessment and, and some changes have been made, but ought that 
a process have caught that before, I guess, is my question. So, so I've talked a little bit about three or uh, four areas where I think if we're going to go to um, improving uh, the record of uh, helicopter accidents in Canada, there are some areas where there's some payoff. It's paying attention to the large, largest population operating in, in terms of their experience and looking at that and trying to, uh, I guess, systematically have a look at it to determine if the competency and experience matches the tasks that, that were being required and, and assist in getting the level of experience and exposure and critical thinking that's required uh, for them up to the level that's required to mitigate risk. Uh, cockpit recorders, the discussion that I'm having there is I in order to do risk assessment and analysis and then mitigation, you really need to understand what's happening in your operations. And there are ways out there uh, with uh, uh, devices and, and to get parametric data to understand operations um, and, I, and, to, uh, and to, to take a better look at what, what's going on and then mitigate it. And then again, take a look at the specific mis missions and look at risks mitigation. And that's sort of the last, so it's the last uh, case that I'm talking about. So I'm, uh, I'm done and I would be happy to talk about anything. Uh, if you have comments, if you want to tell me that I really don't have a clue what I'm talking about, I'm happy to have a conversation, but I'd appreciate any points of view you might have or questions. Thank you. Yes. Um,
I would think in the purest sense, the ultimate goal would be to have industry uh, voluntarily adopt recommendations and best practices. But here, in this case, uh, you've identified four areas uh, of concern to the board. So my question is, what value or merit does uh, a regulatory approach take? And then uh, second to that is, outside of an investigation report, what mechanism is there for notions and ideas and general observations to translate into regulation? Um, best, best practices. We, uh, uh, Andy Chagro is the chair, uh, they gave a presentation at the Helicopter Association of Canada. who has established a series of best practices that they're encouraging helicopter operators within their, within their environment to do, such as wearing a helmet, trip checklist, or you're doing firefighting operations, you're doing anything. And those are available out in industry. They're industry best practices. We are encouraging that. Uh, we support that. Uh, we're not going to start advertising that thing, but we, we think it's it, the <coughs> international helicopter safety. All of those ten, we think, are, are, are good initiatives. I just picked those that I think are perhaps more pertinent to that sort of inexperience level group because there is some in there about, for example, uh, maintenance practices, which, which I think is a different sort of issue when you hear about in this. In this. Uh, some of them are uh, simulator training, for example. So you're not going to necessarily get at the VFR to your pilot with simulator complexity of simulator training and complex emergencies, et cetera. You'll get that bad at the higher end of certain types of operations. So I pick those. All of them are important, and all of them have been identified by industry out there as ways to try to attack the problem, and we are supportive of that. Uh, to the extent that uh, we, uh, we, when we make recommendations to the regulator, to the TSB recommends that the Transport Canada require something be done. We are fully cognitive of, conscious of the fact that that's going to take some time if they seem inaccessible. They may do it, they may not. There's all processes involved in regulatory change that gets influenced. It's not just what the TSB wants, it's what industry will, will accept, what the regulator will accept. There's a balancing of all kinds of issues of cost benefit, of regulatory change, of impact, etc. We, we look at it from a safety perspective and say that would have occurred, but we think it would be safer. We have we don't come up with many of those recommendations. They're quite few and far between. Not every accident will come up with a recommendation because not every cause or that we find as part of that investigation 
that would not be unique to that investigation. And I could just read you an example here. The pilots who flew below the minimum elevation figure and close to the ground are at risk of encountering unchartered obstacles. It was, took place in this, but it's not unique to this accident because that can happen anywhere, anytime. Right? So that's a systemic issue within the industry. Now, there's no way we could make a recommendation to Transport Canada that says you must ensure that every obstacle that's possible that a helicopter can hit is recorded. I mean, that's just not a practical way to do it. But when we identify it as a finding as a risk, industry has the ability to read these reports and act upon those systemic issues themselves. Right? And that's every report that we do, every investigation that we do, we take it beyond the blinders associated with what is unique and specific to that occurrence. Okay? So that information is available. I hope that helps a bit. Oh, sorry. You mentioned a couple of times that um, these four points that you made in the end were your points. Um, is there a difference between the four points, with no disrespect to you, is there a difference between the four points that have impressed you or that you would like to focus on than from, uh, say, a task force assembly of the TSB? Um, well, I guess from my perspective, what I, what I wanted to do was try to get a message that I would, um, excuse me a sec. Hmm. I'm just going to move down here. Well, I'll, what I'll tell you is what I was looking at when I came up with this is all of these issues that have been identified by the International Helicopter Safety Team as issues that, if, are, if addressed, are likely, to, in their view, to impact on the accident rates. And, and what I did, it, plagiarism is only bad in academia. And, and, and because this is a, a, a set of people who are well familiar with the operation, well familiar with the issues, have done lots of research. You can see the, the studies that they've done and that they've said these are all areas, if, if addressed. What I was looking at was the, also the experience level because in my review of many of the accidents that I've seen since coming to the board, the, the issue of pilot decision making and weather minimums uh, has been a key, a key issue in some of the helicopter accidents, as well as the sort of what I would call operational supervision and operational risk assessment by management or governance in, in, in operations. Like, set, I won't say setting somebody up, but putting somebody in a circumstance where they may not have the appropriate tools because of their experience level to make good judgments about whether they should do something or not today. And so from my perspective, I said all of these are, I would say all of these are appropriate and good. And the TSB in many of its, most of its reports would find no problem with any of those at all. I just said if I'm coming to talk to a helicopter group and I want to talk about where's a good area to make some high impact, let's, let's diminish it. I, I could have talked about them all. But from my perspective, in that group, not all operations of helicopters in Canada are the high-end offshore IFR, where you're talking about uh, access to simulator training, you're talking about uh, mandated requirements and regimes and all, all that. You're talking about the majority of helicopter operations in Canada, 70% of them are in the kind of environment we're talking about. Low experience levels, low time, and all the other issues of the environment. And so which ones are particularly salient in my view for those folks? But all of them have, uh, uh, are all good, good ways to address the issue of helicopter accident rates. That's kind of my take on it, if that helps. Okay, anybody else? 
Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it.